Welcome everyone. The webinar will begin at 930 and will be recorded for you. Connect with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading on social media, on Facebook, like the page Campaign for GLR, and on Twitter, follow the account at Reading by Third. Please use the hashtag Learning Tuesdays and tag us to tweet anything you learned from today's webinar and we'll be sure to retweet. We encourage you to share your questions, reflections, and observations on social media. Once again, the campaign wants to connect with you on social media. So on Facebook, like the page Campaign for GLR, and on Twitter, follow the account at Reading by Third. The webinar will begin shortly and will be recorded and shared with you afterwards. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's GLR Learning Tuesdays webinar, Protecting the Building Blocks of Early Learning, an Urgent Priority. My name is Sarah Torian, and I am a consultant with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading and am managing this weekly online learning series. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to go over a couple of really quick housekeeping details with you. First of all, I'd encourage you to introduce yourself. Let us know your name, organization, and the name of the GLR coalition that you're a part of if you're a member of a GLR coalition using the chat box on your Zoom screen. And please be sure to check to all panelists and attendees in the two option of the chat box so that everybody can see who's in the room with us today. Second, just wanted to share that all webinar attendees will be participating in listen-only mode during today's webinar, and thus to avoid any background noises or distractions during the presentations, but we do strongly encourage your active engagement throughout the conversation, and so I'd encourage you to share any thoughts or reflections that come to you during the presentations using the chat box on your Zoom screen, and to pose any questions that you'd like to ask of our presentation team using the Q&A box on your Zoom screen. And for those of you who've been joining in for these conversations, Conversations for a while. This is a little bit different. Previously, we would have you pose your questions in the chat box, but we do now have a dedicated Q&A box, and so I would encourage you to look for that, post your questions there. It makes it much easier for us to track those questions and share them with the presenters when we move into the Q&A portion of the webinar. Third, just wanted to remind everyone that today's webinar is being recorded and that a link to that recording will automatically be sent to everyone who registered for today's conversation in an email that will go out early next week. So I'd encourage you to keep an eye out for that and feel free to share it with your colleagues or rewatch the webinar yourself. And then finally, just wanted to give you a heads up that we will be posting a very brief survey poll after the presentations and during the Q&A portion of the webinar. And so I just encourage you to take a couple of quick moments to share your thoughts and feedback with us through that. Make sure these conversations are um, relevant to your work and meeting your needs. It's a critical part of our, continuous, our commitment to continuous improvement. Now I'd like to share just a little bit of background about the GLR Learning Tuesdays webinar series. As you can see on the screen in front of you, we've got a number of great sessions planned for the coming weeks in our regular time slot of 3 p.m. Eastern time, including one this afternoon. So I hope you'll be, uh, be able to tune in for that conversation as we explore the critical challenge of digital inequities in this time of remote learning. Um, we've now hosted more than 35 webinars since the launch of GLR Learning Tuesdays last September. So I would also encourage you to check out clips that's the campaign's Community Learning for Impact and Improvement platform, where you can find the growing archive from these online learning conversations, exploring the best science, ideas, and programs uh, 
uh, to inform our work to ensure early school success for more children from low-income families. And if you're not familiar with CLIP, I've included a link, posted a link in the chat box so that you can find that and find and access this great archive of information. And then I hope that you'll continue to save this date and time and make plans to join in for more of these online learning conversations every week. But now for today's conversation. This is the first in a month-long series of seven webinars that are going to be exploring the learning loss recovery challenge, the magnitude of the pandemic pre precipitated learning loss presents a near existential threat, particularly to early school success for children in economically challenged families, neighborhoods, and in rural communities. Assuming that most states are able to open up their schools in the fall, children, as well as teachers and school leaders, will face a continued unprecedented set of challenges. And children in particular who are entering kindergarten will be beginning school without that critical bump in foundation, foundational skills that are offered by Head Start and other pre-K and early learning programs. Supporting these young learners and their families to mitigate and reverse the learning loss uh, caused by COVID-19 closures represents an urgent priority for all of us. So today we're going to be exploring some real-time data that sheds a light on this challenge and learn about some strategies and resources that we can use to support these young children and their families. And to guide us through this conversation, I am incredibly honored to introduce our moderator for today, Dr. Jacqueline Jones of the Foundation for Child Development. Jacqueline is the Foundation's President and CEO and is responsible for developing and implementing the organization's strategic vision and goals. Prior to her tenure at the Foundation, Dr. Jones served as a Senior Advisor on Early Learning to the Secretary of Education, Arnie, Arnie Duncan, excuse me, and is the country's first Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy and Early Learning in the U.S. Department of Education. Prior to her position in the Obama administration, Dr. Jones served as the Assistant Commissioner for the Division of Early Childhood Education in the New Jersey State Department of Education and as a Senior Research Scientist at the Educational Testing Service in Princeton, New Jersey. So as you can see, she was absolutely the perfect person to guide us through this uh, critical conversation exploring the issue of learning loss recovery for young children. So welcome, Jacqueline. Thank you so much for joining us and for moderating today's conversation. Thank you, Sarah, and, uh, and thank you to all the folks who have decided to join us and take time for this conversation. Over the past few months, uh, our lives have been upended by this global pandemic. Who would have imagined that we would become so familiar with social distancing, asymptomatic transmission, and the weekly jobless claims reports? From its inception, the Campaign for Grade Level Reading has recognized summer learning loss as an important impediment to children's school success. This year, we face an extended period of learning loss as, as schools and early childhood settings have closed across the country and for some fall openings remain uncertain. Our guests for this webinar have all been thinking about the impact of COVID-19 on young children and their families and we're delighted that they have agreed to share their perspectives this afternoon. Our presenter will be Dr. Pamela Cantor, who is the founder and senior science advisor for Turnaround for Children. In this capacity, Dr. Cantor specializing in trauma has practiced child and adolescent psychiatry for nearly two decades. She founded Turnaround for Children in 2002, after co-authoring a study on the impact of 9-11 attacks on New York City school children. Today, Turnaround translates scientific knowledge about how children develop and learn into integrated tools, resources, and services for educators, school leaders, and school systems, helping to establish the conditions and practices that drive learning and growth so that all students can thrive. We also have two commentators. Dr. Philip Fisher is the professor, Philip H. King Chair and Professor of Psychology and Director of the Center for Translational Neuroscience at the University of Oregon. Dr. Fisher is also a senior fellow at the Center on the Developing Child and a member of the National Science Council on the Developing Child. Both are based at Harvard University. His research 
which is funded by the National Institutes of Health since 1999, has focused on developing and evaluating early childhood interventions and mar in marginalized communities and on translating that scientific knowledge regarding healthy development under conditions of adversity for social policy and programs. Our second commenter is Elena Rivera, who is the Senior Health Policy and Program Advisor at Children's Institute in Oregon. Elena joined the Institute in 2015 and is responsible for building strong linkages between child health and early learning systems through policy, advocacy, and systems change. So we are delighted that all three of, the, of you have chosen to be with us and welcome to you. Um, so Pamela, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, you know, COVID-19 has caused all sorts of disruptions for everyone, school closings, parents working from home or going into essential jobs that put them at risk to uh, contract the virus. What do you see as some of the impacts that these disruptions have had on the sense of safety and well-being that young children need in order to develop and thrive? Thank you, Jacqueline. You are touching on something that I call the COVID paradox. Because today, to stay physically safe and to keep others safe from this virus, we must practice physical distancing. But the very thing that keeps us from catching the virus threatens the connections that help us feel safe, manage stress, and grow and learn. Young children are experiencing disruptions to some of the most important relationships and communities in their lives. Their friends, their classrooms, their teachers, their grandparents, some of the people they trust the most, people who can help them cope with stress, manage their fears, and build resilience to future stress. It's true that there is more time with families, but families are experiencing significant stress themselves, and that is an awful lot for children to witness and absorb and understand. Pamela, can you help us to understand what stress can mean for the ways in which young children develop and learn? You know, stress is the most common naturally occurring example of negative context. When we experience stress, cortisol is released through our brains and our bodies. It produces that familiar feeling of fight, flight, and freeze. It's intense when it happens. But if the stress is mild or tolerable, it's actually adaptive. It makes us alert and sharp, and it helps us prepare for an event like a test or a performance. This is our limbic system at work. Attention, concentration, focus, memory, preparation. But when children have persistently high levels of stress, and when that stress is not buffered by the presence of a trusted and calm adult, something else can happen. Children can get locked in that fight or flight feeling where it just doesn't let up. Cortisol can do a lot of harm to the structures of the limbic system that regulate focus, attention, and emotion. Because today we know that adversity doesn't just happen to children. It happens inside their brains and bodies through the biologic mechanism of stress. But fortunately, that's not the end of the story. There's a big upside when we turn to another hormone, and that's the hormone oxytocin. This is the hormonal system that produces feelings of love and trust and safety. And that's not all. Oxytocin hits the same structures of the brain as cortisol. But oxytocin is the more powerful hormone because it can literally protect children at the level of the cell from the damaging effects of cortisol. This means that relationships that are strong and positive that can cause the release of oxytocin not only help children manage stress, it offsets the damaging effects of cortisol and produces resilience to future stress. So when we speak about the human relationship, we're not just talking about being nice to a child. We're speaking about a connection that's built 
through consistent caring, protection, presence, and trust. One that can make a child believe something about themselves that they couldn't believe until you entered their life. Now, we all knew relationships were important, but this is the biologic basis of the why and the how. In fact, the human relationship, oxytocin, are the most powerful example we have of positive context. And when you put all of this together, it means our brain is a dynamic living structure made up of tissue that is the most susceptible to change from experience of any tissue in the human body. And there are three things, only three things you need to remember about brain development. Astounding malleability, experience dependent growth, and the role of context. And because of this, there's no such thing as a developing child independent of context. So Pamela, could you say a bit more about your idea of context and what informs your thinking around, around this notion of how important context is for the developing child? Absolutely. I wonder how many of you, I bet a lot, um, are familiar with the famous marshmallow test. It was a test conducted back in the 70s at a nursery school at Stanford where nursery school children were put in a room with a marshmallow and presented with a choice, eat the marshmallow right now or wait 15 minutes and then you would get a second marshmallow. Well, the research finding on the children who could delay gratification and exert self-control for that length of time were correlated with success at school, higher SAT scores, college accepted, later careers. Let's look at how it went. forward to 2012. Dr. Celeste Kidd was a researcher at the University of Rochester who had worked in a homeless shelter. And she asked herself a question. Would any of my kids from the shelter ever have waited to get that second marshmallow? So this researcher repeated the marshmallow test, but under a different set of conditions. First, she put the children in a room with broken crayons and promised to come back with brand new ones. And in half the cases, that's exactly what she did. But in the other half, she came back and she said, sorry, I don't have them after all. Then she repeated the marshmallow test. And what do you think happened? The kids who got the new crayons where the promise was kept, they waited, waited, waited for that second marshmallow. The kids who didn't get this, where the promise was broken, they gobbled up that first marshmallow right away. So it turns out that this capacity to delay gratification and exert self-control has a lot to do with whether you trust the person giving you the marshmallow. But here's the thing. Dr. Kidd challenged the assumptions in the original test and made the leap to understanding that self-control, this skill that is so important to learning, is not just in the child. It's in the child in a context that was designed to reveal this skill. In this case, through the experience of a trustful relationship. This researcher altered the microenvironment around these children 
And by doing that, she was able to reveal the skill, the malleable skill of self-control that these children actually had. And she did this by establishing trust with them. Think about what this story means about the environments we could create to reveal the potential skills and talents that exist in all learners. And think about the talents we as adults don't see and won't see unless we design the environments to reveal them. So how do we make this a reality in all of our education settings? Well, in 2017, we were among a group of leaders, educators, researchers, scientists of an initiative called the Science of Learning and Development Alliance. We came together with lead fund funding from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to answer a question. How do we use 21st century science to transform 21st century learning? And if we did, what science should we pay attention to? Well, the findings were summarized in three papers that are available to you, but the big aha was realizing that our 20th century system was truly never designed to develop a whole child. It was never designed to develop a learner. It was never designed for equity. It was never designed to unleash student potential. And the scientific knowledge we have today calls for a shift that goes right to the ultimate purpose of education. And what the science is saying is clear. The ultimate purpose of education should be the comprehensive development of the whole child and the learner inside that child. So how do we do that? Well, the science calls for a design mapped to the way the brain learns, a design that combines relationships, environments filled with safety and belonging, integrated supports, the intentional development of the critical skills, mindsets, and habits that all successful learners have, and rich, meaningful instructional experiences where children discover what they're capable of. Settings designed this way are like an ecological vaccine because they're rich in protective factors that ignite the developing brain, promote resilience and wellness, and protect children from the damaging effects of stress all at the same time. These are the five non-negotiables for whole child design, because the development of the whole child emerges when we combine these elements into experiences that connect to one another. And if you wanna picture this, picture a web, a web of experiences, because this is how our brains actually develop. Lots of connections that happen between the structures of the brain. And it's these connections that produce increasingly complex skills. And a great example of this is how we learn to read. First, we're read to. We learn to recognize letters and how letters form words and sounds and create images and feeling. And we like the feeling of being read to. Because each part of learning how to read involves different brain structures getting wired together through the experience of learning to read. And eventually, we become able to do this complex thing called reading. This is how our brains become integrated and wired to produce any complex skill. So take a look at this PET scan, this is a PET scan of a brain reading, and look at the structures that are lighting up. You have sight, you have hearing, you have expression, you have comprehension, and experiences that grow our brains can happen anywhere, schools, communities, ball fields, everywhere that children grow and learn, and in our homes. So Pamela, how can parents and teachers build this kind of context, this kind of environment that you're talking about, either at home when the, and when the time comes when school reopens? Yes, well, especially now, during this time of COVID-19, we actually have no choice. The path to a calm classroom is a calm brain. The path to learning is a calm brain. And the path to both of these is to prioritize activities 
that build relationships, establish routines, and promote resilience. And at Turnaround, we call these the new three R's, relationships, routines, and resilience, the three non-negotiables for healthy development and learning and managing stress. And these activities that we're gonna be talking about can happen now at home and also are essential when kids return to school. So let's go a bit deeper and I'm gonna give you some examples of each. So the first is relationship. Well, relationships are the active ingredient in any learning environment because they're the way that trust was built, the trust that we've been talking about, the one that releases oxytocin, the one that activates the limbic system. And activities that are oxytocin boosters include things like those serve and return interactions that we do with younger, younger children through babbling and making faces and playing peekaboo. These not only build a brain, they co-regulate children and build those regulation skills that are crucial for resilience. And then there are advisories for older kids with teachers, whether these happen online right now or in person when kids return to school. And family meals, family meals that are cooked together where kids actually take the lead on designing a menu or even doing some of the cooking or interactive games. And family meetings are so crucial right now because kids need to talk about losses, about their fears about COVID. And most of all, so important to this community is reading time every day for reading, but also for building those regulation skills. And there are opportunities today for older kids to mentor younger ones because they're home together. When I Let's see if we can find, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna I get to two, two more R's. Mm -hmm. um, the, the next one is building strong routines, what we mean by this. I don't know whether you realize that the brain is actually a prediction machine it loves order, it's calm when things are orderly, and it knows what's coming next, but it gets anxious when things are not predictable. So things that we can do at home or at school, we can build a daily schedule with kids. They can actually build the schedule. So there is regular time for lessons and movement and journaling and reading. And we can make that routine planner visible so we can post the things that we accomplish and celebrate those successes and set achievable goals for learning and wellness and reading and post them on the refrigerator <laughs> or other places around home. And then there's building resilience. Well, today, building resilience is likely the most important task we have for ourselves, for our kids. But you might think that building resilience is something you either have or you don't, like eye color. But resilience can actually be built like a muscle. And the key to building it is recognizing first that we all have strengths to build upon, and even some we didn't know we had. And the key to making them stronger is building our regulation skills, physical, emotional, behavioral, cognitive, through co-regulating activities that we do with each other and our children. So whether you're a parent or a teacher, make sure that you have good, credible resources for understanding stress and how to reduce it and build regulation skills. And we've prepared a whole resource page for you at turnaroundusa.org slash GLR, and the password is potential. And you can model healthy lifestyle habits for your kids around food, around sleep, nine hours a day. They're watching you. Yes, you have heard this before, but did you know that each of these things will actually build your immune system? And teaching and practicing some form of meditation or meditative movement for adults as well as kids, dancing, walking to a repetitive beat counts as meditation and doing it with your kids builds regulation skills. Historically, there's been a false choice in education 
between the things we need to do on the social and emotional front and the things we need to do for physical wellness, emotional wellness, and the pursuit of academic excellence as if these things were the soft stuff. But the COVID pandemic is a traumatic experience and it's a trauma that's happening that we all are experiencing. But no one likes the word trauma. It sounds like something that is damaged and no one wants the label. Trauma is really a disruption in development of relationships, of mood, of behavior, skills. That's what it is. And what kids want to know and what we all want to know is that whatever it is, it can be fixed. So today, the integration of these domains of development are a non-negotiable given the level of stress that adults and students are on. Relationships, health, wellness, mental health, our social, emotional, and cognitive skill development, and the development of competencies like reading, this is one developmental story and it applies to all of us. Thank you so much, Pamela. I have, I have one more question for you, and that is, is there some hope in this, in this situation amidst this crisis? Do you see any kind of silver lining for young children's growth and development, and for, I guess, generally, the way they're educated as a result of this crisis? The COVID pandemic has laid bare the advantages that some children have and the gross inequities for others. If you just take broadband alone, 9 million children in America don't have access to high-speed broadband or internet or connected via devices to access remote learning. The school door is closed for them. And until we bridge that chasm, the school door will stay shut and this is unacceptable. But for now, in addition to pri prioritizing the three R's of relationships, routines, and resilience, I am urging schools when they reopen to focus on relationships, focus on learning who each child is and where each child is physically, emotionally, cognitively, academically. The push is going to be toward their academic skills, but the foundation is in these other skills. What used to be thought of as the soft skills are actually the foundation for learning, wellness, and recovery. The building blocks for learning, strong trusting relationships, the essential skills like a self-regulation, executive function, mindsets like belonging and growth mindset. These are foundational skills for learning and for the development of all of those higher order skills and self-direction that we want kids to have for learning and life. So I do see an opportunity in this crisis, but it is to disrupt our system and to transform the 21st century education system using 21st century science. It is 2020 today, but exactly 100 years ago in 1920, Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. And at the time, people believed that something called miasma caused disease. But his discovery was based on a new theory that germs cause disease. So you could think that everybody celebrated this, but they didn't. They resisted it because it challenged all of their underlying assumptions about what causes disease. But then something big happened, World War II, and millions of lives were saved by penicillin. And you had this huge database that supported the new theory and the new solution that the drug represented. This discovery changed the field of medicine forever. And I believe that we could be in one of those inflection points right now. But you can see every day that there are battles where science is challenged. And it tells us that resistance to scientific knowledge is alive and well, even today. And our penicillin, were we to use it, is clearly spelled out in the science of learning and development. And it is an optimistic message. Genes are chemical followers. That's the biologic truth that context shapes the expression of our genetic potential. 
we can ask and answer the same question as researchers in other fields have asked. The same question that Dr. Celeste Kidd asked with the marshmallow test. What can we do that will work optimally for this child in this context? And it is that question that gets you to a fundamentally different answer about the way our schools and our education system of the future needs to be designed. One that is designed to see and unleash the potential in each and every child. There has never been a better moment, a better reason, or a better opportunity to tackle the answer to that particular question. And that is at least the potential silver lining that I see. Thank you so much for letting me talk to you today. Thank you so much, Dr. Cantor. You've given us so much to think about, and I'm sure that our audience has a lot of questions. And, uh, and I'm going to ask Dr. Fisher to now weigh in on this conversation. And, and, you know, you've done some very interesting research that I'd like to hear about. Can you tell us a bit about your assessment instrument, the rapid assessment of pandemic impact development in early childhood. That's quite a mouthful. Rapid mm -hmm. is easier to say. Uh, just give us a sense of what it is and uh, what it's intended to reveal. Sure. Thank you, Jacqueline. And, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with everybody uh, this morning or this afternoon, depending on your location, and to share some of this information with you. Uh, why don't we go ahead to the next slide? Uh, which it just shows a few of our funders, and then to the slide after that. So um, when we uh, started to, to have the first impacts from the pandemic uh, here in Oregon, our team really started to be concerned about what was going on in households in which there were young children. We've done a lot of work along the lines of what Dr. Cantor was just talking about, focusing on how stress affects child's, uh, children's well-being and how, um, how supports can really be instrumental of the type that she was talking about um, to help mitigate some of the effects of those kinds of stressors. Um, but what was really clear to us was that we were facing a situation here in Oregon and nationally and, of course, globally that was unlike any that any of us have, have lived through in our lifetimes, um, and that there was really an absence of high quality uh, data to really help us hear the voices of households with young children, to understand what was going on, to understand what the challenges are, what some of the stressors are, also to understand uh, what was going well. And uh, as I'm sure many of you know, research typically takes a long time to get started. You have to write grant proposals and you know get all these details together. In this case, we knew we did not have the luxury of time um, if we were going to really capture what was happening and really be able to listen to the households uh, in which there are young children, we really needed to get up and running quickly. And so um, on the prior slide, we saw a few of our funders who really jumped uh, with us into this project to do um, high quality data collection in ways that could be really useful uh, for informing understanding about what was going on. And I think some of that is to, is to reflect back to households themselves. Some of it is to reflect to uh, child care providers and early childhood educators uh, to understand what's going on in households, and some is really to impact policymakers. The project that we launched, as Jacqueline said, is called RAPID, um, and it is a weekly survey uh, of over a thousand households that we conduct, with, and each household has to have at least one child aged five or under. Um, the surveys are nationally representative each week in terms of geographic distribution, in terms of income and race. Um, and the surveys are essentially just a 10-minute uh, Qualtrics questionnaire that can be completed on computer or on smartphone. Um, we pay participants for their um, information that they're providing. The survey is in English and Spanish, and we're working to have it uh, also available in other languages. Um, we have a number of fabulous partners, including some organizations that have very large online networks of households with young children um, that have been able to push out information about the survey to the families that they work with. And we'll be providing um, links uh, in the chat so that if folks on this call are also interested in letting 
families that they work with uh, know about this survey, that people can join and participate in the project. Um, every week we've been posting on medium.com a, a list of results about what we're finding, and that's what I'm going to be talking about uh, today is the majority of the findings that we've come up with to date. And then we're also creating policy briefs beginning this month that we can use to send out to policymakers about what it is that we're finding. I think we're all ready to hear what you're finding. Uh, this is a really interesting response to this, this challenge. Uh, I, I empathize with the notion of getting a study done really quickly, and I think this is, this is one, a good testimony to you and also to funders who've been willing to just support this work and get it done quickly. So what have you been learning? Yes, please. Um, so let's go ahead to the next slide. Um, so the first thing, and the, this probably will come as no surprise uh, to anybody that's listening, but when we look overall at how things are currently versus how they were, so people reporting on how things were before the pandemic, we see uh, that things have gotten more challenging in a number of areas. Again, all very relevant and germane to what Pamela Kenter was talking about. So first of all, 68% of the caregivers um, that we've surveyed reported an increase in stress uh, and difficulties with well-being since before the pandemic. So let's just hit the continue button. Um, we also note that 48% uh, of those who responded report decrease in family income. 22%, um, and I'll touch more on this in a minute, reported difficulty paying for basic necessities in their household, which talk about a really high stress um, kind of experience. Needless to say, that's really up there. Um, and then also, and I'll talk about this a little bit towards the end, 34% of caregivers, and those numbers seem to be growing really pretty dramatically each week, um, are reporting delaying seeking health care for themselves or for their child. So as we can see, things are not uh, looking great. And again, I think everybody can expect that um, in terms of sort of overall changes that, uh, that we were, have, have been seeing being reported from before the time of the pandemic until uh, now. So that, that's sort of the main overall finding. But let's dig in a little bit deeper and go to the next slide. So we also started to look at whether there were differences between subgroups um, in the, the surveys that we were collecting uh, data from on a weekly basis. Uh, and the first thing that stood out to us and was really quite dramatic was that when we looked across the board at reports of, of, of parent and other caregiver well-being and of child well-being, it was households in which there's a child with a disability that seemed to be among those that were struggling the most. So you can see 70% versus 40% of reports of caregiver anxiety, Similarly, more than double reports of depression uh, and higher levels of stress, also loneliness in the, in the context of caregivers who have a child with a disability. And then also dramatic increases in child behavior problems and child anxiety in these households. So clearly an area that has gotten some attention in the media, but we've really talked about this as forgotten households, that households um, in which there may have been issues already with, uh, with everybody feeling somewhat isolated, not necessarily having as many social contacts in their community, um, and also in which there's a tendency for services to be delivered, uh, you know, via face-to-face -face interaction, either in the home or in early childhood education setting. Those things have gone away, and we've heard from many caregivers that um, in addition to that, that sort of telehealth, when it is available, and certainly it isn't in many cases, but that it may not be suitable for a child with a disability to be interacting over, uh, over, over screen. Uh, so let's continue, uh, and I'll talk about some more of our results. And Jacqueline, I can't remember exactly when you're going to jump in, so just jump in whenever it seems appropriate um, to, uh, to, to ask some more questions. I will. You just keep going. Great. Okay. So um, we also looked at differences between lower income households um, and other households, and we define lower income as at 1.5 times the uh, federal poverty cutoff. And again, not surprising 
what you see is the same across the board uh, difficulties that are at a higher level in terms of uh, parents and other caregiver in lower income households. I think this slide is pretty self-explanatory. You can see both the yellow and the green show the lower income households for caregiver reports and then for the reports about the children in their care. Uh, let's go to the next one. So this slide is actually one of the most concerning ones that we've seen um, because it really relates to this whole question of flattening the curve. Um, you know, people have talked about that there's a, a pandemic curve that relates to viral infection rates, but also have referred to a so-called second curve, which follows in terms of uh, mental health difficulties that people who are dealing with the pandemic uh, are experiencing. A lot of that's been reported on the part of, um, of essential workers. What you see here um, is that it, Essentially, for middle and upper income households, uh, in the weeks following the time that we started, even though there was an initial jump from before to the beginning of the pandemic in difficulties that people were reporting, uh, things leveled off pretty quickly. And you can see that by the dotted line along the bottom. But as you can see, in contrast, the curve for low income households has continued to elevate in terms of the mental health difficulties that are reported in children. They're continuing to go up in terms of both behavior problems and anxiety in lower income households. So we are not seeing a flattening of the curve there. And just like with the pandemic, until we start seeing a flattening of the curve, this is something that we should be greatly concerned about. Next slide, please. The same is true in terms of the, the curve continuing to increase in low income households for caregivers reports of their own mental health difficulties. And again, we see that the curve has flattened uh, for middle and higher income households. People have kind of adjusted to the stress and it actually seems to be even falling off a little bit. Uh, can you just advance one more? So the other thing that we found that was particularly concerning, and I alluded to this earlier, is that we looked at what might uh, help us understand why adults were reporting ongoing mental health difficulties and increased levels of stress. And the single driving force in that, it wasn't general income difficulties, it wasn't difficulties with work, it was specifically the loss of access to food and being able to, feed, to have enough money to feed their children. Um, so here you can see food insecurity as a really determining factor in what's going on in lower income households during the pandemic uh, as something that's creating a lot of stress. Let's go to the next slide. The last thing that I wanted to touch on briefly is what's been happening with pediatric well child visits. I'm sure you all know that well child visits are one of the primary preventive healthcare uh, kind of frameworks that we have in this country uh, and they, the, the kind of the standard schedule of well child visits has been around since the late 60s in terms of these frequent visits that occur in the first year of life, somewhat less frequent in the second year, um, and then annual visits after that. Um, if you advance to the next slide, what you can see uh, is that we have been uh, finding uh, that the caregivers that we've been following um, and parents and other caregivers report a very high rate of concern about taking their child to well child visits, over 75%. Um, and within a month, what we found was that 27%, which is almost three times the typical rate of, of parents and other caregivers, reported missing at least one well child visit. And actually, the one visit in the first two years that was most frequently being missed was the immediate postpartum one, the one that happens in the first month of life, where many people were saying they were skipping that one. There are many issues that are likely to arise as a result of this in the long term. People have talked about vaccinations as one in terms of disease prevention, but there are also issues that relate, again, back to what Dr. Cantor was talking about with respect to being able to have somebody look at the caregiver or parent-child relationship, looking at uh, tracking the growth and development of the child and screening for uh, developmental disabilities and other kinds of syndromes. So these are things that we're seeing not happening. And again, if we had three times the rate in the first month, 
uh, we know that things are likely to continue to increase in terms of the percentage missing those visits in subsequent months. Okay. So these are these are amazing data. Uh, I think you know it's the the difficulty is that while they are they're striking, they're also somewhat predictable. And I think for that we have to think about where we are as a country. Uh, but I'm going to ask you the so what question. So you've got these data. How are you connecting this with policy and, and, and development? It's a great question, Jacqueline, because needless to say, I mean, it's interesting because when we started uh, talking to various folks, including funders, about this project, they said pretty consistently, you know, this is not the time for research. Research is great, but you research all, researchers all talk to each other a lot, and that doesn't necessarily have the impact that you always talk about. This is not a traditional research project. This is really designed to amplify uh, the voices of parents and other caregivers and to impact policy. So a couple of examples. Uh, if you look at the, the food issue that I referred to, one of the reasons that food has become such a challenging issue is because for households that relied on uh, two meals a day at the education setting, with schools closed, that's now become uh, a, a significant challenge in terms of that not being a source of nutrition. Um, a number of states have made it easier uh, for SNAP benefits to be available uh, and for other kinds of benefits to be made available so that loss of income and lack of access to food can be easily replaced. And communities themselves are also coming together in many ways to use schools as food distribution centers and so forth. So, this is an example of how if we can say, look, stress levels are increasing. We know from all the research that's not good. Here is a clear source of stress. Uh, that can make a huge difference uh, in terms of figuring out what kinds of things might need to happen to make a big difference. So this is kind of how we're trying to think about things, is to let the word be known about what households are saying so that policymakers are better positioned to create policies that are family friendly and that promote the three R's that uh, Dr. Cantor was talking about. Great. And, uh, let's, let's hope we can get policymakers to really see these data and get these data highlighted so that they can use them effectively. Uh, yes. Do you see opportunities for those in the grade level reading network to get involved with this work? Uh, we would love to partner with those in this network uh, around the work that we're doing. Um, there are a variety of ways that people can get involved. One is just to simply follow our weekly postings on medium.com. Um, but I also encourage you uh, to push the information from those postings out to your local policymakers, whether it's people on your city council um, or in, on your local school boards. Anybody uh, that can see this information and get it that these are issues that um, really require attention. Um, and I, I do want to say one thing that um, I think has been a, a common theme that many have been um, arguing for, which is these issues that we're, we're seeing here, as you said, Jacqueline, they're not that surprising. These are issues that um, in terms of inequalities and other kinds of, of challenges uh, certainly predate uh, the pandemic. And, and I think what's happening is that we're just seeing kind of all of these things being put under a magnifying glass. So we're seeing greater inequalities um, happening. As a result, we really see this as an opportunity to transform policy in early childhood, not just, you know, for this immediate period, but for the long run, um, to make early childhood education uh, more accessible, more universal, more valued, uh, more higher paid, uh, and so forth, and to also provide more family supports for early childhood because we know that parenting is really difficult. So beyond following the rapid EC um, postings on medium.com, we also encourage people and uh, some links have been provided to share the link for participating in the weekly survey um, with fa families and households that you have contact with. Um, and. Um, to continue to follow on the website that we have for the project, the developments that are forthcoming, including the policy briefs that we'll be putting out there. Thank you so much, Phil. It's great work.
Now, My Elena, pleasure. you've been patiently waiting <laughs> on the side, uh, but you've been advocating for policies and systems that promote child health and well-being in Oregon for several years now. What are your reflections on what you've heard from Dr. Cantor and Dr. Fisher today? And what do you see as some opportunities and challenges that lie ahead for those of us who care about young children and their families? Yes, thank you, Jacqueline. I am so honored to have this opportunity to provide a few reflections on these incredible talks we just heard from Dr. Cantor and Dr. Fisher. And Dr. Fisher, you teed me up perfectly. Um, I don't know about everyone else, but I am feeling so motivated and so well informed by this information. And so what I hope to do is just prompt us all to think about what we can do to take action on this information and really take the opportunity to build back better um, for our systems that serve children and their families. So our speakers offered some really rich information and several themes stand out at me. You can see them on the next slide. Thank you. Uh, the first is really around the importance of families and relationships as core to how children develop. So as we've heard, nurturing relationships with caregivers can be a buffer against the stress and trauma that children are experiencing now. And at the same time, family stress and instability has an enormous impact on children's health and development. So if we want children to be resilient and to have strong and healthy relationships, we have to understand what families need and ensure those needs are being met. And so that means perhaps looking beyond our early learning and education and pediatric healthcare services to thinking about what resources and services are needed to support parents' health and employment and financial stability and social connection just because families are so crucial to children. The second message our speakers have really highlighted for me is that families and communities are being impacted unequally by the pandemic. Um, my background is in public health and so I've studied how health and education disparities result from these long-standing social and economic factors like intergenerational poverty and institutionalized racism. And the tragic reality is that these same factors are at work now. And without strong systems of support or real safety nets in place to catch children and families, we're seeing widening disparities in economic hardship, mental health, as we've seen in Dr. Fisher's work, access to healthcare services as well, and support for learning at home, these are all the things the Campaign for Grade Level Reading Network has been hard at work tackling. And so it's devastating to see potentially losing ground and that these disparities could be widening. And then that takes me to the third theme, which I feel is this immense urgency to act now. Um, as Dr. Cantor spoke a bit to, history tells a really clear story about what happens to children during and after a widespread crisis, whether it's uh, the September 11th terrorist attacks, or we've also seen this with hurricanes Maria and Katrina, that in the wake of a crisis, um, there's a second wave of uh, mental health impacts and huge impacts on children's development, losing ground. And so this really tells us that the time to act is now. We're seeing the impacts start to play out um, day by day and compound week by week and so we really can't um, can't stand to lose any time in our action when i think about what the challenges are facing us in this moment a few things come to mind um, first we heard this great research from dr Cantor about brain science and, and child development that children can be especially vulnerable to trauma so prolonged stress or that negative context that Dr. Cantor spoke to, um, that really alters children's brain chemistry, their behavior, their learning, their physical and mental health. And now is a time when those stressors are building up. Um, at the same time, we're seeing this 
um, interesting phenomenon that children may not be at the forefront of the conversation about the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, from what we've seen so far, children are one of the populations least likely to get severely sick or be hospitalized with the coronavirus. And so many folks may think of them as being largely protected from the pandemic and its effects. Um, we all know that's not true, especially after these talks today. And so it's our job to raise awareness about how the pandemic is impacting children now and what the long lasting ripple effects could be. And that, ch that challenge of building awareness um, it also offers us an opportunity. So on the next slide, thank you. We have the chance to really look at our existing early childhood system and build it back better. Um, some may say we don't have an early childhood system to begin with. Um, others might know we have a system, but it's made up of a lot of disparate programs, services that don't necessarily fit tightly or work well together. Either way, I think we can all agree there's room for improvement. And so what we've heard today, I think, really offers us a framework for building back better and thinking about what it means to really hold families at the center and understanding whole child development and the importance of relationships and also driving toward equity and how do we prioritize access to opportunity for children and families who have been most marginalized and most neglected by our systems and are being most impacted right now um, and by acting with urgency now. And so I really believe we can each play an important role in this work. Um, if you're, a, I know the Campaign for Grade Level Reading Network is really broad, and so there are policymakers who are engaged, there are educators, funders, um, early childhood providers, and parents as well, and we can each take action to build this future that we want to see. And so I'm an early childhood advocate, and so for my fellow advocates, I think our job really starts with listening. Um, to what families and communities are saying about their needs, and also what are their stories of resilience. Dr. Cantor spoke to resilience as being one of the foundations of child development, and just how important it is to understand resilience, kind of break it down. And so we can learn from examples that are emerging from communities about what are the key ingredients to resilience, and how do we enable those success factors to emerge um, in more families and more communities. And so at Children's Institute, as an early childhood advocacy organization, um, we are really working to collect stories from all across Oregon, hearing from families, from childcare providers, from nurses and pediatricians, all sharing about their experiences right now. We've heard examples of how early intervention providers are um, doing amazing work delivering therapy services virtually. We've heard fear around children missing out on well child visits and immunizations and what that could mean in the long run. And we've also heard about families who don't have access to food or diapers or other essential needs. And so these are stories we can learn from and we can also share with policymakers at a community, state, and federal level so that the concerns of families are really front and center as we pass legislation, relief packages, and budgets in the coming months, and long term as we think about reopening the economy, re-engaging families, and redesigning services over the coming years. Um, we really have seen that pairing stories with data can be a powerful combination. And so I think we're all motivated now to use Dr. Fisher's survey findings to really help spread the message about the widespread impacts that families with young children are facing. And as we lift up stories and data, we have to look for what are the opportunities to connect? So are there new and creative partnerships that we can forge? Um, and after we make that connection, what are the ways we can take action together so maybe a nurse who shared his story with us about mental health challenges he's seen. He wants to be a spokesperson for this issue and um, could write op-eds or testify to the legislature. 
or maybe we have a congressional representative who's really passionate about child care. And so we can connect her to a few child care providers who want to share about their needs and challenges so that she's equipped with that information as she goes into conversations about reopening the economy and what it will really take to ensure child care is equipped and ready to meet needs as parents go back to work. Um, and action is so important at a community level as well. Over the past couple months, I've heard some incredible stories about communities coming together to deliver school meals and learning boxes to students in their homes, um, and about communities finding ways to give parents a chance to come together virtually to connect, talk about their challenges, celebrate successes, and just share advice with one another. We know that kind of community support can be a buffer to family stress, just as families can be a buffer against a child's stress. And that's advocacy in action as well. So through each of the individual relationships and individual actions, we really can build a movement around children and families. And so I'd love to wrap up by just asking, um, you all to each ask ourselves <laughs> what role we can play and how we can step up to care for our own communities, um, to listen for stories and find opportunities for connection, and to advocate for the change that we really know we all need to ensure children have the care and the support that they need, both now and, and into the future. Thank you, Elena. You know, before we open up for discussion uh, and I throw it off to, to Sarah again, I want to thank each of our, our guests for an extraordinary conversation. Uh, we know that this pandemic has had a, a, a debilitating impact on, on lots of families and children. And yet I keep thinking relationships, routines, resilience. We can do this. We can get through this if we have in our heads what it is that children need to be able to grow and thrive. I also think this notion of research that is, that is targeted to a particular focus that gets it out there really quickly. Uh, Phil isn't waiting two years for a peer review journal. He's got to get these data out. Uh, it is absolutely critical that we think more and more in that way because we will have these situations again and we must be ready. And the advocacy notions are absolutely critical. We've got to get people to use these data, to use what we know about early development and make sure that we, that we make good policies. Uh, you know, I, I, I said to Elena, uh, a governor, Governor Cuomo has stolen her bill back better, uh, but I think it is exactly what we need to do. Uh, our structures are not necessarily serving us well. The inequities in this, in this country have been highlighted, and now we have to figure out what is a good, a good structure that can be rebuilt or built. And I think it's, it's probably using these data and using this opportunity in this moment, what we know that will help us to build a system that really does work for children and families. Uh, so Sarah, it's, it's all yours. Well, I would just like to second what Jacqueline just said in terms of thanking our presenters for these amazing um, comments and presentations, the, the data, the richness of the data, as well as these powerful tools, and so much of it that we kind of know inherently, but um, it's so, it's, it's great to understand how we can support children and understand what is really happening in, um, in the households of the families and the children that we care so, so much about. So. Our Q&A box has been overflowing with uh, folks who are on this webinar today who are interested in learning a little bit more, digging into what you've shared. So I'm going to ask all of all of the members of our presentation team to um, turn on their cameras and we'll, so we can see everybody at once. And Pam, or Dr. Cantor, I'm going to start with you, if I may. Um, you were talking at, actually at the beginning of your presentation about kind of this COVID-19 paradox in terms of you know, wanting to protect our physical safety while also, um, you know, or while trying to protect our physical safety, it's, you know, breaking those important social connections that are so critical to um, social emotional development and, and children's um, growth and learning. One person was asking, you know, 
thinking about that and then thinking about the transition as child care centers begin to open again, um, what are the implications for child care providers who are being would be asked to wear masks that hide their faces to protect the children, but also, you know, all that we know about the, the engagement and the oxytocin that's delivered between seeing each other's expressions and that back and forth serve and return. Are there any tips or thoughts about how to mitigate the, the impact of that or how to protect the health and safety while also providing for that engagement between um, caregivers and the infants and toddlers in their care? I, I think that, you know, children really are at varying ages capable of understanding what they need to do if an adult has explained why they need to do it, the context for why they need to do it, and brought them into it. If things are arbitrary, if a child isn't prepared for a change like that, then the effects could be frightening, um, let alone not, not supportive to, um, to connection. Um, the other thing, um, the kinds of things that, that I think can be done is masks can be decorated in, in personal kinds of ways. I mean, there are all kinds of ways that adults and, and children can convert the process of wearing a mask into something a child can understand and something that can be personalized. And then an adult and child pair up together to know that they're being safe together and that there, there are good reasons for it. Elena, like to share any thoughts on that as well? Well, I, I would just add that there, you know, there is so much evidence of what Dr. Cantor was talking about in terms of malleability, uh, especially in terms of early childhood and what we see in terms of brain development. And, you know, there is a very uh, strong research suggesting, for example, that uh, children who don't have the ability to see have very strongly developed uh, auditory cortices of their brain so that they can really pick up quite well, uh, you know, more so and have more sensitivity to hearing. So I understand that there are, there are legitimate concerns about, you know, is there a, a missing channel of information? Um, but I, I expect that with the tremendous adaptability that many children have, um, that between auditory cues and even if you can only see eyebrows and foreheads and eyes, um, that children will be really adaptive. I think that emphasizing the quality of the relationship is really what's important here and not so much whether there's a particular channel um, that's less accessible than it was. Would you like to add anything, Elena Rivera? I don't have anything to add. Those are really incredible insights. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so Maybe we could stay with you for a moment. There were lots of folks who wanted to dig in the nuts, into the nuts and bolts of the rapid EC survey and the way that you're looking into this data. Um, people were asking, one, if, you, if the data can be broken down by state um, so that they could kind of learn more about what's the situation in their state. Uh, people wanted to know if you've disaggregated by race and ethnicity and any kinds of disparities and issues you've seen there, and also if you've seen any regional differences in the data. So I'm going to throw a bunch of questions at you all at once. And Thank you for, for those questions. I saw them popping up on the screen, and I thought, oh, good, a bunch <laughs> of equally data-minded data people, which is really exciting. Um, the, uh, the data are still accruing every week, and so our ability to do a lot of fine-grained segmentation is somewhat limited. Um, but let me tell you, for instance, because I, I definitely picked this up, and it's really important, race and ethnicity differences um, you know, what we're finding and, and also how can they be contextualized um, so that we can understand them. So perhaps the, the most um, sort of vivid example of this is that we, in our data, uh, in terms of well child visits, found that there were more visits, significantly more visits being uh, not attended by uh, African American and Latinx households than by uh, white households. But we ask, uh, because contextualization is really important, we asked, well, what, what might this mean and what's driving this? And there were two factors uh, that came out as the strongest. One, um, and then, by the way, they're both related to barriers to access that I think uh, are really important to note in households of color. 
So one had to do with a concern that would predate the pandemic, uh, having to do with not being able to get time off work to attend a well child visit. Um, and I think, again, that's a noteworthy pre-existing barrier. Um, and there have been racial and ethnic differences identified in participation in well child visits um, prior to the pandemic that these are consistent with. The other one that we found quite interesting, and again, has policy implications, is people reporting that they couldn't attend a well child visit because there are other people in the home, particularly uh, elderly people in the home, who they're concerned about and they're providing care mm -hmm. for at the same time. And again, this is reflective of the demographic of probably more extended families, multi-generational households um, in households of color where there would be more concerns about health. So I think it's really important to not only tell the story of what we're seeing in terms of racial and ethnic differences, but then to contextualize them to the appropriate kinds of understanding. Um, and that's something that we've been really cautious to do. In terms of state and regional differences, we have seen some of these starting to emerge. Um, in terms of the states, we don't really have quite enough data to be able to make state-based interpretations. We do see some greater challenges in the Southeast uh, and South in general relative to other parts of the country in terms of some of the stress levels. Um, but one of the things that we're hoping to get going in the next couple of weeks is actually to launch a number of statewide surveys that provide representative samples in specific states, because there are a lot of states in which really interesting things are happening. Some of them are things that are really progressive and exciting in terms of access to more benefits, and some of them are really concerning in terms of lack of social distancing. So we hope to be able to do that. So just a quick follow up on that. Is that something that um, if there are are those states already set and predetermined, or is that something that if people in a particular state were interested in having, um, digging in a little bit deeper to their uh, state context, could they reach out? It's to you? It's, if they're not preset, uh, Oregon is high on the list just because we're based here. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a number of others. Really, the issue is funding. Uh, we have this infrastructure now to be able to do this, and so it's a question of the cost um, to be able to launch a survey that's in a particular state. Um, but apart from funding, we're really ready to go. And again, we're really interested. So if there are folks listening from specific states, and especially if you have either funder connections or there are state funding connections to make something like this happen, we'd be eager to talk with you. That's great. I know that there are a lot of funders on the call, so uh, they, they will have heard that message. Um, uh, Dr. Kinner, I'd like to come back to you again, if we could. Um, one person was asking about the roles of cultural and ethnic knowledge and pride and community action and activism um, and the role that that plays in helping um, young children of color learn to self-regulate and become resilient and thrive. Um, can you share any um, particular comments on that in terms of what you've yeah. seen in your research? You know, one of the reasons when I was speaking about resilience that um, I wanted to draw out the nuance of the strengths that all of us have. And for us not to understand resilience as, well, you start with a blank canvas, you assume that certain kids don't have it, and then you just start building um, this thing called resilience when in fact what we actually know is children who are regularly daily exposed to the experience of adversity are developing some pretty remarkable skills for resilience and and histories of being able to surmount difficult things often with an enormous amount of grace um, and and skill those histories are embedded in their cultures and in the heroes of their cultures. And oftentimes children are not hearing the stories of that, of those here, of those people. And, and so there are like dozens of reasons why history and culture is a foundation for children's resilience and resilience building in positive kinds of ways. I mean, if you imagine in your own life, hearing a family story of somebody two generations ago that was able to do X or Y under a set of conditions, what does that convey to you 
about who you are and what you're a part of. So culture is one of the, the extraordinary repositories <clears throat> of resilience for kids, but the stories have to be elevated and told. They have to be made visible. That's powerful. Um, thank you for that. Um, one other question we had from somebody was um, in terms of thinking about the importance of relationships and that in the current situation right now, they felt like they were well positioned to support relationships with the children that they were trying to stay engaged with during these closures because they had had several months at the beginning of the school year to build strong relationships with the children and with their families. Um, but so thinking forward into the, you know, the coming school year and concerns about whether or not um, child care centers and schools will be able to open in the fall at the beginning of the school year. Just wondering if there's any um, uh, strategies to build strong relationships in this kind of situation of remote access and connections. One of the words that, um, that I would use probably other than strategy is opportunity. And there are opportunities that are outside of schools and traditional education settings that, that are just rich with the opportunity for kids to connect with adults in positive kinds of ways. And this is at all, of all ages. And right now, one of my big fears is that those kinds of settings are threatened. They're threatened. Funding wise, they're threatened and they're threatened because of COVID. But, but all of us know that many of the important relationships of our lives didn't happen inside of school. It could have happened on a ball field. It could have happened with a mentor. And it's a tremendously important thing right now from a policy perspective to make sure that those settings are not shut down and are not um, affected because they are one of the most wonderful places um, for kids to be able to have those sorts of opportunities. And if they are open, even though schools may be struggling with the decision to open, to close, to close again, to whatever we may have, I, I really think we have to look at the other infrastructure in the community as the opportunity that it is for kids to form relationships. Can I, as a right, if I add to that really quickly, I completely agree with what Pamela is saying. I also just wanted to note that this is really an area where the, uh, the equity gap in terms of things like technology is so important. And just to give a brief example, my wife is an early childhood special education consultant. One of the families she works with lives in a mobile home on the back of somebody else's property. Um, they heard that their school, uh, the school that one of the older children attend, attends has, has Wi-Fi hotspots that they were giving out. Um, they weren't able to get to the school to get one. By the time they got there, uh, the, you know, the hotspots had run out. And I think what we're seeing, if you look at some of the media coverage, is like, well, you know, a media or a, 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 a you know, a, a, a Wi-Fi company will make uh, will make Wi-Fi available to everybody in the community for free. But when you really look at what's happening, it's like it's available in a parking lot, uh, which means you have to get in your so-called car and drive there. It could be 100 degrees. Um, the bandwidth is limited. And so I think from a policy perspective, we also have to think it's not enough to check the boxes. We have to understand there are policy measures that are being implemented. Do families know about them? Are they able to access them? And are they working? Uh, and if the answer to those things is no, then I don't think that, you know, it's sort of like the box has to be unchecked. And given what we're seeing in terms of equity issues in this context, it seems like we really need to continue to be very vigilant about these things so that um, we're able to mitigate as much as possible some of the issues that I think will be facing uh, kids when they do return to school. Agreed. So um, you all are getting back to a point that all three of you made, and it's a, we've had a couple of questions about this, that this is not just kind of a moment in time challenge that we can address. This is the, our current kind of the COVID-19 pandemic situation is 
shining a bright spotlight on um, systemic um, issues that have been um, there for a long time and have been harming our children and families for a long time. So one person was asking, you know, um, or we're sharing that it's, you know, there's, it's, it's difficult, a challenge to really disrupt the system, even when we have the science that we can point to um, and um, that she was sharing that she's been told that it's squishy um, and that, um, you know, our systems are so entrenched. So just asking advice, and this is, goes to all three of you, um, you know, how does one disrupt a system when it is so intractable, even when the pandemic provides so much obvious evidence for supporting, um, you know, the critical foundation of early development and, you know, supporting the whole child. Um, so maybe we'll start with you, Elaine, or with you, Dr. Tanner. Elena, go ahead. You're on I mute. You're on mute. There you go. Okay, well, we'll be trying to figure out the technical difficulties there. Um, Dr. Kanner, would you like to start? And then we'll try to figure out what's going on with you. There is an appetite now, I, and I wouldn't equate appetite with disruptive force, but there is an appetite that I haven't seen before, particularly at the policy level for re-examining this lack of, of holistic approaches um, to student development and, um, and student learning. So I see something very potentially powerful going on right now with people seeking what have we missed and, and very, very disturbed by the inequities that have been laid bare. I, the thing that gives me a sense of, of optimism on the disruptive side is part of just a small story. And I asked somebody who is very, very uh, in the world of technology, could technology ever be recruited for whole child purposes, for human development purposes? Does it have to stay narrow? Or could it become something that really becomes an infrastructure for developing a whole child? And then, if such a thing were mobile, it would move wherever the learner moves. It wouldn't be necessarily only dependent on a setting. So to me, one tool that we have to explore if we are going to achieve true disruption of this system it is the idea that development and learning can happen wherever the child is. That's the disruption we have to work toward. And by learning, we can't be talking about math facts. We have to be talking about holistic uh, dimensions of, of learning. Dr. Fisher, and Jacqueline, I'd love to have you join in too, Dr. Jen. Oh, uh, you know, the, the notion of disruption is always very interesting to me, especially when it is so sorely needed in our early childhood uh, arena. I think we have an opportunity to harness the power of, of voices, of, of parents, of advocates, uh, and, and let's not assume that, they, that those voices don't have any bearing. They have great bearing because they do vote, they do they do reflect the true needs of a community. And so if we have data, if we have a solid understanding of early development, I think it's time we start asking the people at the grassroots level, what's working for you? What's not working for you? We do a lot of speaking for other people uh, when we're not living their lives. And I think those voices are tremendously important to hear uh, and, and to really understand that there is power in those voices. So I think our advocates have a real obligation to get not just the voices of people who are, who are not, not directly engaged with, with young children, but to get the voices of families 
and, and, and communities out there so that you can have some context in which you can start providing services and making policy. Because I see this as a very, you know, we've used context a lot in this conversation, but context is everything. And so what works in one place may not work in another place. And that's okay, as long as we're very, very clear about what the needs of that community really, really look like, and that the community has had a voice in letting us know how we can be supportive. Is Elena back? Yeah, do we have you with, on audio now, Elena? Oh, no, I'm not hearing you. Maybe it's your phone. If you well, she, yeah, I think she switched to different audio. But um, um, Dr. Fisher, would you like to share any thoughts? Uh, I. I just, I think that, I mean, oops, am I also muted? No, I can hear you. Go. Okay, good. Um, you know, I would just agree with what Jacqueline is saying in terms of context being so important. And I think that, um, I mean, one, one piece of information that uh, came to us early on uh, as we were organizing the survey was to ask specifically about community efforts. And the, the person who was talking about it had actually done um, research in Rwanda following the, the whole genocide um, uh, period there and found that the communities that um, in which things kind of recovered as best as possible given how devastating that was um, were those in which there was a strong sense of community connectedness and I, I really do think that um, we can look to policy but we also have to look uh, locally to see how these kinds of relationships that we're all emphasizing can be strengthened uh, in this context and, and how we can be creative about, about kind of creating those kinds of networks um, to really make sure that children are as resilient as possible. Mm -hmm. um, can we try with you one more time, Elena, just to see if it works? I'm sorry. Can you speak? No. Okay. I'm so sorry for those technical difficulties. I was really excited to hear what you would say to that one. I got so involved in the um, Q&A conversation that I dropped the ball. I'm posting the um, survey poll that I was supposed to post earlier, but I'm, we're going to leave it open until the very close of the webinar. So if you haven't had a chance to, I hope you will take just a couple of quick moments to share your thoughts and um, feedback through that. Um, also, just would love to say a deep and heartfelt thank you for our amazing presentation team. Um, I know that I was incredibly inspired and informed by all that you shared today, and I know that this is a very busy and crazy time for all of us, so I want to thank you for taking time to pull together this presentation and share um, your, this information and resources with our network. So thank you to Dr. Pamela Cantor, to Dr. Phil Fisher, and Elena Rivera, and to our amazing uh, moderator who walked us through this conversation today, Dr. Jacqueline Jones. Um, and then also just wanted to give you another uh, reminder that there is more in store for GLR Learning Tuesdays today. I hope you'll tune back in in an hour for our next uh, webinar conversation exploring an issue that's come up a couple of times in today's conversation, this critical issue of digital inequities um, that pose a significant barrier to supporting children and families in this time of remote learning and remote telehealth and support and engagement. Um, so that will start at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Um, also, just wanted to uh, encourage you to tune in for more of the um, Learning Loss Recovery Challenge webinars that we'll be hosting beginning today and continuing throughout the month of June. Um, and then thank you to all who joined in today. I hope you will continue to join in for more of these online learning conversations and uh, be well. Thank you so much. Bye, y'all. Bye, everybody. Bye.